This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. It is my pleasure uh, this afternoon to introduce uh, Elizabeth Farnsworth, who will then in turn introduce our distinguished guest reader. Elizabeth Farnsworth joined PBS's NewsHour in 1984 as a contributing correspondent until becoming a senior correspondent in 1999, concentrating primarily on covering foreign affairs and the arts. She remained on staff until 2004, when she became a special correspondent for the program, reporting on foreign affairs from Latin America and the Middle East, among other places. Her writing has appeared in Foreign Policy, World Policy Journal, the San Francisco Chronicle, The Nation, and other publications. She has recently brought, brought to bear her fierce intelligence, courage, and compassion on, in the documentary field. She has received many honors, including two Emmy nominations and a 2010 DuPont Award for POV's The Judge and the General on PBS about the transformation of a conservative Chilean judge charged with investigating the crimes of Augusto Pinochet. Currently, she is a fellow at the Center for Art and Environment at the Nevada Art Museum in Reno, where she is working with landscape photographer Terry Evans on an exhibition for several museums on prairie and people in the White Earth Valley, one of the key centers of the North Dakota oil boom. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Elizabeth Farnsworth. Thank you, Giovanni. I'm honored to introduce Robert Hass in this magnificent setting, and especially to you, poetry lovers. I recognize that many of you know Bob as a friend, colleague, professor, and are familiar with his work. And perhaps you will agree with me when I say he has what Cheslav Milos called in another context, quote, a gift, a grace, despite the force of gravity. The phrase jumped out at me because it so closely describes my understanding of Bob and his work and his life, his joy which spites the dread and the bitter ghosts he writes about so well. The image that kept coming to mind as I thought about Bob was the French high wire artist Philippe Petit as he walked between the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in 1974. You may have seen Man on Wire, the great film about that act of blissful courage. If so, you saw Petit's astounding joy above the abyss. And it reminds me of Bob. I first met him in 1995 in Iowa City, where he and his wife, poet Brenda Hillman, were teaching for a semester at the Writers' Workshop. He had just been appointed Poet Laureate, and I was doing a profile for the news hour. He asked me and my crew to come out on a deck. It was a temporary place that they lived in. It was a beautiful woods, kind of a ravine with the woods, and Bob was smiling conspiratorially, and he picked up this little plastic basin and pointed to muddy paw prints in the bottom and said, raccoons, they use it for a hot tub at night. <laughs> and that set the tone for my four interviews with Bob in the years that followed, mostly while he was Poet Laureate. He lobbied heavily for his art, um, very effectively, and he played an important role in launching the NewsHour's coverage of poetry as news. As far as I know, we're the only national news program to cover poetry in this way, and Bob helped make that happen. Cheslav Milos once said that Bob has, quote, a perfect ear for English referring to his poetry and translating. And I think this also applies to the way Bob talks about poetry. In an interview in 2008, when he won the Pulitzer Prize and a National Book Award for his collection, Time and Materials, my colleague at the NewsHour, Jeff Brown, asked a question about Bob's poem, The Problem of Describing Trees. What is the burden on you, Jeff asked, that you must come up with a way of describing the world? In answering, Bob first remembered Milos and said, quote, 
He'd lost so much he felt like everything he didn't get down, if he didn't get it down, then nothingness won. If art doesn't preserve our memory of the gift of life on earth, we've lost, and I also have that feeling, that one of the things poetry can do is say, I was here, I was alive, here's what it's like for me to be alive, end quote. And I think this explains Bob's enormous ambition for his art and also his many achievements, not only the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award, but the National Book Critics Award for Criticism, the Mark MacArthur Genius Award, and many others. As you all know, he's a beloved professor at this university. He's also a poet, essayist, translator and editor, and news flash. Just a few hours ago, we learned that Tomas Tranströmer won this year's Nobel Prize for Literature, and Bob edited a collection of his works published in 1987. Today, we get to hear about Bob's work with the incomparable Czeslav Milos, and it's my great honor to present Robert Hass. Thank you, Elizabeth, so much. The honor is to get introduced by my amazing friend. Thank you so much. Um, Thomas Tranströmer won the, the uh, Nobel Prize. We were told this morning, this, uh, the, the, this occasion is to remember the 30 years that Czesław Milos was among us. But let me say a word about Tomas this morning. Um, I, there's, I have a story to tell about him. 15 years ago, he had a stroke. Tomas uh, did not live in Stockholm, where Swedish writers mostly live. He uh, made his living as a, um, I think the Swedish term is a behavioral psychologist, but it meant he was basically a, a psychotherapist and a counselor for troubled adolescents in a working class city northwest of Stockholm for most of his adult life. His wife was a nurse, so they lived in the world in a very real way. Tomas was, even 25 years ago when I edited a book of his poems, probably the most loved living poet among poets of the world. Um, when I was in Shanghai recently, I met the met brilliant young poet Shi Xuan, who's coming here. I said, who are you reading? Who are the Chinese poets reading? And he said, Tranströmer. Um, so anyway, he's, he's amazing, and you should hunt up his work. 15 years ago, he had a terrible stroke. He was a very vigorous man, um, and he was completely paralyzed. His, his wife was told by the doctors in their hospital on his right side. And Monica, his wife, got into her Volvo and drove to Stockholm while he was in the hospital and bought all the piano music for one hand and put it on their piano. And when Tomas got home, um, said, get to work. <laughs> and two years ago, his publisher um, published a CD of uh, Tomas reading his poems and also playing some Debussy and uh, Schubert for one hand, which you get by um, going to the website for Bonners, B-O-N-N-I-E-R-S. Um, I was trying to think of one short thing to read to give you a sense of him. His poetry is drenched in, in, um, in uh, the Swedish weathers. And uh, his family had a summer house on an island in the Swedish archipelago uh, in which there is a medieval church. And, a, and an image at the center of his poetry that's remarkably like the images in Polish poetry and in Czeslaw's poetry is of, um, is of the baptismal font in this church. This is a poem written in the, in the 1980s. In the half-dark corner of a Gotland church, in the mildewed daylight, stands a sandstone baptismal font, 12th century, the stonecutter's name still there, shining like a row of teeth in a mass grave, Hegwalder, 
the name still there, and his scenes here and on the sides of other vessels, crowded with people, figures on their way out of the stone, the eyes kernel of good and evil bursting there, Herod at the table, the roasted cock flying up and crowing, Christus natus est, the servant executed, close by the child born under clumps of faces as worthy and helpless as young monkeys and the fleeing steps of the pious drumming over the dragon scales of sewer mouths. The scenes even stronger in memory than when you stand in front of them. Strongest when the font spins like a slow tumbling carousel in the memory. Nowhere the lee side, everywhere risk. As it was, as it is, only inside there is peace in the water of the vessel that no one sees, but on the outer walls the struggle rages and peace can come drop by drop, perhaps at night when we don't know anything or when we're taped to a drip in a hospital ward. Get a sense of, I mean, no kidding, he's, he's an amazing, <laughs> he's an amazing poet. Um, 35, one other to get this other side of him, his love of music and his way of talking about and thinking about his art uh, is a poem called Schubertiana, which I won't bother, uh, Allegro. After a black day, I play Haydn and feel a little warmth in my hands. The keys are ready, kind hammers fall. The sound is spirited, green and full of silence. I, uh, I shove my hands into my hide, uh, I'm sorry. The sound is spirited, green and full of silence. The sound says that freedom exists and someone pays no tax to Caesar. I shove my hands in my hidden pockets and act like a man who is calm, uh, calm about it all. I raise my hidden flag. The signal is, we do not surrender, but want peace. The music is a house of glass standing on a slope. Rocks are flying, rocks are rolling everywhere. The rocks roll straight through the house, but every pane of glass is still whole. <laughs> anyway, Thomas Strandströmer, with whom I once had a drink with Cheslav Milos. In New York, I got to see the two, these two poets sit down together. Uh, this is the centenary of Chesov's birth. He was born in 1911. We had a, a symposium on his work in the spring, but uh, we wanted to uh, put a photograph in, in the library. It was Dave Dewar's idea, and it's a wonderful idea, idea to honor his amazing presence here. I think there are only a couple of others. Oakley Hall, uh, one of the wonderful novelists to graduate from this university, is over there. He wrote a novel about um, Berkeley fraternities called The Ordeal of Joe Hall that was the patent place of its era, the <laughs> scandal novel. If you haven't read it, you should find it. Cheslov came here in 1960, I, and there's this, there's 50 years of his poetry, and I have now about half an hour in which to, and I thought maybe a place to start would be in his last years here, um, or in, in, the, in the latter part of his time of exile. Um, he was born in Lithuania in 1911. He, uh, Lithuania was part of the Russian Empire. His dad was an engineer in the Russian army, but it was Polish speaking. The gentry owned the farms. Lithuanians were the peasants. It was very like the, uh, the relation between Ireland and England. He went to the university in Vilnius, uh, in the capital of which was then called Vilno, the Polish name for it. And it was the place where the two greatest Polish poets, the guy Miskiewicz, who was the Pushkin of Polish poetry, and Savatsky, who was the Keats of Polish poetry, both came from. And Czesław, going to college, lived not far from the places where they had lived as students. You know Poland. I mean, later, years later, he went was at the university in Krakow, and he had used to have lunch in the place where Copernicus had lunch. Right? Is that old? <laughs> but so in the early 30s, 
um, he went to the, what would have been the, let's say, t as if to Dublin, to the universe, to Trinity in Dublin. That would have been his university. It was the place that was thought to be the place where the purest Polish was spoken and uh, where poet after poet had gone into exile because they had gotten involved in politics and fought for uh, Polish uh, freedom. After he graduated from college, he and friends canoed from, Par from Warsaw to Paris, carrying the canoe and foraging, going from river to river, went right through the middle of Germany during the years of the rise of Nazism. Uh, during the war, he was, in Krakow, he was in Krakow first, went from Vilna, where he had a job in the radio, to Krakow, from Krakow to Warsaw. He was in Warsaw for the years of the war and of the Holocaust. Um, he saw the city dynamited by the German army almost block by block when they left. He became a diplomat with the new Polish government in 1946. He was sent to Washington, D.C. I said, what was the first thing you saw? He said, there were black men on corners selling watermelon. And the cars, old Packards, had immense fenders. <laughs> and, uh, and people went by in convertibles playing the music of Glenn Miller under green trees. He had just come from this destroyed city to, to the United States, where he uh, uh, taught himself American literature by uh, translating the poems in the Partisan Review and the Kenyon Review, the literary journals of that time, and sending them back to, to his uh, keepers who had to decide what the political significance of um, Wallace Stevens' poems about pears was to the Cold War. <laughs> um, in 1950, he, by, by 1950, he felt like he could no longer function in that, in that uh, uh, system. And he uh, also heard that he was on the verge of being arrested. He, he uh, went to Paris, where there was a Polish emigre journal, and he published in it a one page essay called Nay, No, saying I can no longer do this, and he defected and gave up his language. And for 10 years, he survived as a uh, freelance writer as best he could in Poland. There are legendary stories. Jean Hersch, a Polish philosopher who was teaching at the Sorbonne, um, was helping him, and he was broke. His family was in Connecticut. He couldn't, he had no passport. He couldn't get there. He had no money. She showed him in the newspaper that there was a um, uh, annual contest, the French gave uh, 5,000 francs to the best foreign novel. She said, write a novel. He wrote a novel, State of Siege, in the morning. She translated into French in the afternoons. And nine months later, he won the prize and was able to bring his family to. to uh, later years, someone, I heard him, I, I quote this in a poem, uh, someone asked him what he thought of Flannery O'Connor, and he said, you know, I don't agree with the novel. <laughs> so he wrote two of them, but he didn't. He didn't think much of them. Um, he was persona non grata, mostly in France. Um, his only friend among the writers was the only anti-Stalinist among them was Albert Camus. And there is a story that he and Camus wandered into, and Lucien Goldman, the literary critic, were walking one night and wandered into a theater on the West Bank and saw the second performance, the left bank saw the second performance of, of Waiting for Godot and stayed up all night talking about the meaning of it. Lucien Goldman was horrified by it. He thought it was nihilist. He said, this leads straight to the death camps. And they argued all night. What company to have been in, right? Would have been right. But, but he was shut out. Uh, Pablo Neruda was his friend. Neruda was the diplomat from Chile. I'm talking too much. I'm not reading enough poetry. But this life of this man when he arrived here, uh, Neruda was the Chilean cultural attache in France, and he and Cheslov were friends, and they had translated each other poetry. And when Cheslov defected, the French Communist Party newspaper uh, uh, appointed Neruda to write the denunciation of Milos, which he did. And Milos wrote The Captive Mind, one of the most important books about literature and politics in the 20th century, as a response to Neruda. Um, and it's an amazing book. If you're going to read his prose, that's a place to begin. But he, uh, it, f French literary culture was 
was uh, progressive leftist but Stalinist, and they and Chesov was shut out, and uh, had really had no place to turn, and was offered a job at this university on the other side of the world, and arrived here in 1960 um, uh, to become a professor of Polish literature. Um, and um, lived here more or less incognito, though poets began to hear about him for 20 years uh, until uh, suddenly, uh, apparently out of nowhere, he won the Nobel Prize for Literature and became world famous and, uh, and for the next 10 years taught here off and on and gradually as the Polish communist government collapsed and then as the Soviet Union collapsed, he was able to return to his own world and he died in Krakow uh, is it five, seven years ago now. But he lived among us writing poems that no one could read in his own country about the sun going down over the Golden Gate Bridge for 25 or 30 years. And at one point, when he was feeling quite lost, like he'd He'd gone into exile and he'd written his poems and no one was publishing. They were being published, but no one was reading them. And that he, out of a kind of vanity, he lost the bed and cut himself off from his own people. And he was, came into this library and discovered in the map room, which was then around the corner here, the German um, uh, uh, artillery maps of the county in, um, in uh, Lithuania where he spent his childhood. And he could get them out and find his grandparents' house and find the path down to the river and find the place where he got the first glimpse of his aunt in her elaborate white underwear changing to go swimming <laughs> in the river. And, um, and around that time, he started writing a set of poems called The Separate Notebooks. And uh, there, anyway, this begins, this begins in that, in that time and it's about him disappearing into this library. So he's here now. An old man, contemptuous, black-hearted, amazed that he was 20, such a short time ago, speaks, though he would rather understand than speak. He loved and desired, but it turned out badly. He pursued and almost captured, but the world was faster than he was, and now he sees the illusion. In his dreams, he is running through a dark garden. His grandfather is there, but the pear tree is not where it should be, and the little gate opens to a breaking wave. Let me do that again, it's an amazing bit of writing. In his dreams he is running through a dark garden. His grandfather is there, but the pear tree is not where it should be, and the little gate opens to a breaking wave. Everybody have that dream in some form? Inexorable earth, irrevocable law, the light unyielding. Now he climbs the marble stairs of Doe Library and the blossoming orange trees are fragrant, and he hears for a while the tew of birds, and the heavy doors are already closing, behind which he will stay for a very long time in air that does not know winter or spring, in a fluorescence without mornings and without sunsets. The coffers of the ceiling imitate a forest vault. He passes through halls full of mirrors, and the faces loom up and dissolve, just as Barbara, the princess in old Polish fairy tales, appeared to the king once when the black madge conjured her. And all around him, the voices are intoning, so many he could listen for centuries because he wanted once to understand his poor life. That's the opening of this thing. I have to tell you the story of it for me is um, 
I was aware of Chesov's presence here for a long time. I was completely intimidated about approaching him, and then eventually I did, and we fell into conversation, and I asked him about poems I was curious about. One was a very great, famous, but untranslated poem, famous in the little world of when I would come into this library and read my journals like World Literature Today, where there would be articles on, on subjects like, uh, I remember reading an essay on objects, inanimate objects in the poetry of World War II. <laughs> and there was an account of this poem. And I approached him and said, is this poem been translated? He said, no, can't be translated. It's written in rhyme meter like a children's poem. It's, it wouldn't make any sense to America. I said, could I? If you got a copy of it word for word, could we give it a try? So I was working on trying to translate that poem. I'll come to it in a minute. And then he won the Nobel Prize. And my friend Renata Gorczynski, who was the chain-smoking former jazz DJ for a Moscow ra for a, uh, Warsaw radio station, who had jumped ship at a, at a uh, uh, broadcasting conference at Stony Brook and taken a job as the cultural editor of a Polish language newspaper in New York, showed up out here to help Chesov sort the huge piles of mail he was receiving. They were bringing in, after the Nobel Prize, uh, these huge bags, you know, those kind of duffel bag things. You know, every kid in his first grade class, second grade class third, was writing him a letter and he was overwhelmed. And Renata came and immediately put on Dave Brubeck records. That was her idea of America in the 1950s growing up and got out Paul Malls unfiltered <laughs> and started smoking. And I said to her, I've been looking for someone who can help me understand these poems by Milos. And she said, what poems? And I said, well, the world. I, you know this poem? He said, oh, yeah, I know the world. But do you, do you know what this guy is, is, reading, is writing now? And I said, no, I have no idea. And he, she said, well, it's amazing. Listen. An old man. I would say contemptuous. Is that English? Uh, with a black heart. And she started reading this poem to me. Next bit of it. Uh, Lithuania is like Maine. It's a country of sandy, shallow soils and pine trees and hardwood forests and lakes. If, you arrive, you, you, if your first view of California was like Vacaville. You know? <laughs> Sacramento River among barren hills, tawny and spurts of shallow wind from the bay. And on the bridges, my tires drum out a meter. Ships, black animals among the islands, gray winter on the waters in the sky. If they could be called in from their far off Aprils and countries, would I know how to tell them what is the worst yet true, the wisdom not for them that has yet come to me? trying to think about that world here. I did, I'm skipping now. This poem is organized into separate pages. That was page 10. This is page 13. I did not choose California. It was given to me. What has the wet north to say to this scorched emptiness? I, I had trouble with this at first, being a local patriot, right? <laughs> California, a scorched <laughs> emptiness, my. How can the wet, what can the north, wet north say to this scorched emptiness? Grayish clay, dried up creek beds, hills the color of straw, and the rocks assembled like Jurassic reptiles. For me, this is the spirit of the place, and the fog from the ocean creeping over it all, incubating the green and the arroyos and the prickly oaks and the thistles. Where is it written that we deserve the earth for a bride, that we plunge in her deep, clear waters and swim, carried by her generous currents? Page 18. Lovers walk in the morning on a path above a village. They look down into the valley, dazzled by themselves and by their part in the earth of the living. Brook water below, green meadows, and on the opposite slope, a forest rises up steeply, tears up steeply. 
They go where a black woodpecker flickers among the firs and the scent of new clover rises from the edge of a gorge. And now they have found a footbridge among the trees, a real bridge with a handrail that leads somewhere on the other side. And when they walk down, they see in a frame of pines the roofs of two towers, green copper glistening, and they hear the thin voice of a little bell, that cloister, small cars high above it on the road, and in the sun the echo and then silence as the beginning of a revelation, what kind they don't know, because it will never advance beyond its beginning. Some memory of a walk with somebody he's falling in love with back in that green world. And then the memory of a, a genuinely crazy person following a visit to uh, Eastern Oregon. Uh, this is, uh, okay, uh, the earth in its nakedness of hard lava, hard lava carved by riverbeds, the vast earth void from before the vegetation. And the rivers they came to, called by adventurers Columbia, rolled, the river they came to, called by adventurers Columbia, rolls down her waters a cold and liquid lava as gray as if there were no sky nor clouds above. Nothing here except the winds of the planet raising dust from the eroded rock. And after a hundred miles, they reach the building on a plateau. And when they enter it, an old dream of a volcanic desert comes true. For this is a museum preserving the embroideries of princesses, the cradle of a crown prince, photographs of the cousins and nieces of a forgotten dynasty. The wind beats loudly against the brass door while the parquet squeaks under portraits of Tsar Nicholas and of the Romanian queen Maria. What madman chose this place to dispose the souvenirs of his adoration, lilac-colored scars and dresses in crepe de chine, from the eternal bitterness of the lost fleshliness of lovely girls traveling with their families to Biarritz for the waters, for the degradation of touches and whispers by the muttering of stume, strewn pumice and basalt gravel until even regret wears thin and a deaf, dumb, abstract emptiness remains. This museum is not a dream. It's an actual place. What follows is a brief prose account of it. I won't read all of it. His name was Sam Hill, and he was a millionaire. And on windy heights where the Columbia River flowing down out of the Rocky Mountains has carved canyons for itself in volcanic layers from the time of the Pliocene. And where a little later, men traced a border between central Washington and central Oregon. He started to build an edifice in 1914, which was to serve as a museum honoring his friend Maria of Romania, a beauty on the throne, eldest daughter of the Duke of Edinburgh and Saxe Coburg Gotha and of the great princess of Russia, Mary, thus cousin to both King George and Tsar Nicholas II, was 18 when in 1891, she married Prince Ferdinand Hohenzollern Sigmaringen, whose daughter loaned Rilke the castle for the Duino elegies. Uh, uh, the crown prince. It was rumored that she had un cuisse légère, a light thigh. <laughs> Whatever the truth was, Sam Hill named this building Mary Hill, uniting her name to his, and the inauguration of the museum in 1926 took place with the active participation of the royal guest. <laughs> Page 24. <laughs> if not now, when? Here is the Phoenix Airport. I see the cones of volcanic mountains, and I think of all I have not said about the words to suffer and sufferance and how one can bear a lot by training anger until it gets tired and gives up. Here is the island of Kauai, an emerald set among white clouds, warm wind in the palm leaves, and I think of snow in my distant province where things happen that belong to another inconceivable life. The bright side of the planet moves toward darkness, and the cities are falling asleep each in its hour, and for me, now and then, it is too much. There is too much world. And then a voice 
comes up, which I take to be the voice of a lover speaking to him, former lover. You talk, but after your talk, everything else remains. All the rest, after your talk, poets, philosophers, contrivers of romances, everything else, all the rest, deduced inside the flesh, which lives and knows, and not just what is permitted. I am a woman held fast now in the great silence. Not all creatures have your need for words. Birds you killed, fish you tossed into your net. In what words will they find rest? And in what heaven? You received gifts from me. They were accepted. But you don't understand how to think about the dead, the scent of winter apples, of hoarfrost, and of linen. There are nothing but gifts on this poor, poor earth. That's followed by a prose passage on imagining women's underwear. <laughs> and, and he has a poem about, in which he says um, that one of the Bruegels died of a heart attack while sticking his head through his legs to figure out how to draw his ass. Um, <laughs> I don't know if this is true, but it, but it appeals to me to think that in this poem, Cheslov is trying to imagine what it's like to have a vagina, which is part of his, a dark academy. Assembled are instructresses in corsets, grammarians of petticoats, poets of unmentionables with lace. The curriculum includes feeling the touch of silk against the skin, listening to the rustle of a dress, raising the chin when the aigrette on the hat sways. They teach the use of what is customary, long gloves up to the elbows, a fan, lowered lashes, bows, as well as human speech, so that a faience chamber pot, even if a painted eye looks up roguishly from the bottom, is called a vessel. A brassiere lifting the breast bears the name Soutien Gorge. And in the spirit of French great grandmothers who remembered the red coats of English soldiers, a menstruation is announced as the English have arrived. <laughs> the superior method of instruction in this school and its goal lies in a hardly noticeable smile. For everything is, after all, only make believe sounds of orchestras and promenades, paintings in gilded frames, hymns, corals, marble sculptures, the speeches of statesmen, and the words of chronicles. In reality, all there is is a sensation of warmth and glueiness inside, between the legs. Also, a sober watchfulness when one advances to meet that delicious and dangerous thing that has no name, though people call it life. Poor beauty, page 30 something else, right, in this. Poor beauty, benediction, you are all I gathered from a life that was bitter and confused, in which I learned about evil, my own and not my own in which wonder kept seizing me and I recall only wonder, risings of sun over endless green, a universe of grasses and flowers opening to the first light, blue outline of the mountain and a hosanna shout. I asked, how many times is this, I asked, how many times is this the truth of the earth? How can laments and curses be turned to hymns? What makes you need to pretend when you know better? But the lips praised on their own, and on their own the feet ran, the heart beat strongly, and the tongue proclaimed its adoration. Those are the poems from about 1978, 1979, partly written in, this, in these rooms of this building. The poems that we were working on, the poem, The World, uh, of course, the, all, uh, and during the Nazi years, everything was outlawed, so everything was underground, and Cheslov uh, went with many other writers to um, these underground readings, and his friends, the 
whose closest friend was uh, Gerge Andrieski, the great novelist who wrote Ashes and Diamonds and Canal, from which the famous films were made. He said he began to feel as the writers his age then, he was, he was in his 30s and the audience was mostly people in their 20s and they were reading these kind of existentially tinned stories of defiance when they were in a state of complete helplessness occupied by the Germans and everybody working at whatever kind of menial job they could in order to avoid cooperating with the government. Um, and when he came to feel that the heroic images of meaningless but existentially powerful resistance um, were, were uh, uh, foolish and dangerous, and that he and his friends were doing writing that were killing people. One of the arguments that developed in Warsaw was over the question of whether Copernicus was Polish or German. And as soon as they got there, the Germans who were busily trying to look like they were doing important work so they would not get sent to the Eastern Front, uh, st started doing things like reorganizing the irrational Polish library. So Cheslov had a job during those years as a teamster hauling books from, it would be like the Berkeley Library and the University Library, they should be combined. Somebody was in charge of that, he, and his job was shuttling the books back and forth. So that was when he started reading William Blake the songs of innocence and experience to teach himself English. Because he thought probably either the Russians or the Germans were gonna win, it was gonna be terrible for Poland either way, but there was just a chance that uh, English would be a way out. And he started writing a poem called The World, which was read in one of these underground readings and astonished people because in the opening poem, uh, kids are coming home from school and the poem describes what's in their wooden pencil boxes. And the second poem is about the gate of their house. And the third poem is about the front porch. And the fourth poem is about the hall. And there's dad in the garden. And mom tells them stories. And it turns out to be this strange act of metaphysical defiance in the form of poems of, of an imaginarily simple world. And, um, in, and in it, there's a story apparently told by the mother and it's called Parable of a Poppy Seed. And in, it's written in a, in a meter like a child's meter. And uh, I think the literal goes something like, on a seed of poppy is a tiny house. Inside it are people and a cat. Outside in the yard, a dog who doesn't know he lives in a poppy seed uh, barks at the moon and then quiets down. And so he said, language like a nursery rhyme. So I tried this on him. On a seed of poppy is a tiny house. Inside it are people, a cat, and a mouse. Outside in the yard, a dog barks at the moon, and then in his one world, he sleeps until noon. And I showed it to Cheslov, and he took off his glasses and said, mouse? <laughs> there is no mouse in my poem. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so here's my version of the poem. On the seed of poppy is a tiny house. Inside it are people, a cat and a mouse. Outside in the yard, a dog barks at the moon. And then in his one world, he sleeps until noon. The earth is a, the earth is a seed and nothing more, and that seed's a garden, planet, and that seeds a star. And even if there were 100,000, each would contain a house and a garden, all in a poppy head. They grow taller than hay. The children run through and the poppy plants sway. And in the night, when the moon is aloft, you hear the dogs barking, first loudly, then soft. So he said, 
is it not obvious that poppy is taller than hay? It's <laughs> chest love. I need a rhyme, you know? I, I need a rhyme. <laughs> I, I need to end. And we've, we've just begun this extraordinarily. Anyway, I wanted you to have these poems from this moment. This is from the book called Separate Notebooks. Um, maybe two more. Here's a poem that he loved to read aloud, that he sometimes said um, summed up his view of life. And, that he, and he would always also say that it's an account of a love affair, which lasted about two minutes. And it's called esse, Latin verb to be. And it's a prose paragraph. It was written in 1954 when he was living in the suburb of Bricombe Robert, just outside Paris. I looked at her face dumbfounded. The lights of metro stations flew by. I didn't notice them. What can be done if our sight lacks absolute power to devour objects ecstatically in an instant, leaving nothing more than the void of an ideal form, a sign like a hieroglyph simplified from the drawing of an animal or bird, a slightly snub nose, a high brow with sleekly brushed back hair, the line of the chin, but why does language not have the power of, I'm sorry, the, the line of the chin, but why isn't the power of sight absolute? And in a whiteness tinged with pink, the two sculpted holes of her eyes containing a dark, lustrous lava. To absorb that face and to have it simultaneously against the background of all spring boughs, walls, waves, in its weeping, its laughter, moving it back 15 years or ahead 30, to have it is not even a desire, like a butterfly, a fish, the stem of a plant, only more mysterious. And so it befell me that after so many attempts at naming the world, I am able only to repeat, harping on one string, the highest, the unique avowal beyond which no power can attain. I am. She is. Shout. Blow trumpets, make thousand strong marches, leap, rend your clothing, repeating only this, is. She got out at respite. <laughs> I was left behind with the immensity of existing things. A sponge suffering because it cannot saturate itself. A river suffering because reflections of clouds and trees are not clouds and trees. So. Um, well, there are two magic. Uh, let's do this one. Uh, this is from uh, mid-1980s. News would come to him of that other world, you know, when the kids were coming in in their tie-dyed shirts and, uh, and uh, the campus was full of the sound of Carlos Santana. He would suddenly get a Polish newspaper and read the obituary of someone he knew. Winter. The pungent smells of a California winter, grayness and rosiness, an almost transparent full moon. I add logs to the fire. I drink and I ponder. In Elawa, the news item said, at age 70 died Alexander Rimkiewicz, poet. He was the youngest in our group. I patronized him slightly, just as I patronized others for their inferior minds, though he had virtues I couldn't touch. And so I am here approaching the end of the century and of my life, proud of my strength, yet embarrassed by the clearness of the view. Avant-garde mixed with blood, the ashes of inconceivable arts, an omnium gatherum of chaos. I pass judgment on that, though marked myself. This hasn't been an age for the righteous or the decent. 
I know what it means to beget monsters and to recognize myself in them. Yes, you, Moon. You, Alexander, fire of cedar logs. The waters close over us. A name lasts but an instant. Not important whether the generations hold us in memory. Great was the chase with the hounds for the unattainable meaning of the world. And now I am ready to keep running when the sun rises beyond the borderlands of death. I already see mountain edges on the heaven, in the heavenly forest where beyond every essence a new essence waits. You, music of my last years, I am called by a sound and a color which are more and more perfect. Do not die out, fire. Enter my dreams, love. Be young forever, seasons of the earth. Chesov Miłosz, thanks very much. Thank